Thanks so much for that, Mike. It's um, great to be with you all again as we continue our series on the Old Testament called Kingdom. Um, the Bible is 66 books telling one big story about God's kingdom. Um, and we've defined uh, God's kingdom as God's people living in God's place under His rule and blessing. And over the last three weeks, we've seen um, the establishment, the destruction, and then the beginnings of this kingdom pattern. And so today we're going to see the progression of the kingdom as God's people are formed into a nation. Uh, so let's pray. Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Open our eyes to see the wonders in your word. Amen. Um, our society is built on the foundation of a promise. Uh, promises form the basis of all the relationships in life. Um, in the business world, we enter into contracts, we make promises that define our employment relationship and business partnerships. Um, in, in marriage, we enter into a covenant, we make promises and vows to each other that define our relationship. Um, in friendship, we make unspoken promises uh, to be there for one another through thick and thin, to, to invest in each other's lives for mutual encouragement and enjoyment. Every relationship that you have in this world, whether it's in the workplace, in the home, amongst friends, is defined by a promise. Uh, promises, covenants, contracts, they bring confidence and clarity to relationships. Um, they outline the foundation of the relationship, the privileges and the obligations we owe each other. Promises bring trust and stability into our lives. And I think this is what makes broken promises hurt so much. Um, just as promises build relationships, broken promises break relationships. Uh, so a when a tenant stops paying you rent, the living arrangement is broken. Or when your friend betrays your trust, or when a parent fails to show up for you, you may call into question their love. Um, when you miss out on a promotion you were promised at work, you may start to question your place in the company. Or when your partner who promised they would always love you leaves you for someone else, all those scars will stay with you for a long time. You see, our, our world is built on the hope of a promise. And where promises are broken, our world descends into chaos and despair. Um, last week, we saw that as humans reject God's rule, where they break relationship with Him, God in His grace makes us a promise. God enters into covenant with Abraham. And in this covenant, God promises to create a nation through Abraham's offspring to, to live in the land of Canaan under his rule and blessing. Uh, but from that point on, from Genesis 17, humans are constantly putting this promise in jeopardy. Um, so you might remember, out of self-preservation, Abraham nearly sells his wife Sarah off to a king. Um, when they struggle to have kids, they arrange for Abraham to sleep with his servant Hagar instead. Um, even when God preserves the covenant and brings children for Abraham, his sons Jacob and Esau nearly kill each other. Uh, then later Joseph's brothers sell him into slavery. Now you see, the progression of Genesis is filled with broken promises. And so the story of Genesis is that God must constantly intervene to keep His promise alive, remain faithful to His people, even when they haven't been faithful to Him. And so now as we come to this book of Exodus, God's people are now a nation, just like He promised. And here they stand at a foot of a mountain. It's a place where they will meet with God and where He'll speak to them. 
Uh, this passage is sometimes described as the very heart of the Old Testament because it's here where God outlines His covenant relationship with His people. And in this covenant, God makes a promise to us and we will make a promise to Him that defines our relationship. And so today we're going to see three elements of God's covenant with us that outlines the foundation the obligations and the privileges of our relationship with Him. So first, the foundation. Um, all promises have a foundation. Um, underlying the promise of marriage is love and companionship. Um, underlying the promise of an employment contract is work and salary. And the foundation of God's covenant with us is salvation. Um, in verse 3, as Moses goes up the mountain, the Lord says, Tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. God's covenant rests on his rescue. Uh, the book of Exodus details Israel's slavery in Egypt and how God rescued them from captivity. Um, back in chapter 6, is um, Israel suffer as slaves. God says he's heard the groaning of his people. He's remembered his covenant with them. Um, remember God promised back in Genesis 12 last week, whoever curses you, I will curse. And in Exodus, God keeps that promise. Um, as Pharaoh mistreats and, and persecutes the Israelites, God sends 10 plagues on the Egyptians. Uh, the Nile rivers turn to blood, there's disease, there's locust darkness, then finally the death of all the firstborns. And in each of these plagues, God is judging his enemies through acts of decreation, through decreation. Because in Genesis 1, where God creates light and life and where he brings order from chaos, notice in the 10 plagues, it's the opposite. So the Nile River that was to be this source of life and sustenance for Egypt is turned to blood. Um, we see order is thrown into chaos as creation swarms out of control. Instead of light, now there's darkness. Instead of life, now we hear the cries of death and despair as the firstborns in Egypt die. Um, but for Israel, with whom God has made a promise, they're saved, aren't they? As God's judgment fills the land, it's those that bear the mark of the Passover lamb that are saved. God saves Israel through the death of a lamb whose blood shields them from judgment. Um, and even as the Egyptian, as they bear down on these Israelites, God rescues them again, allowing them to pass through the Red Sea um, while the Egyptians are swept up in these waters of judgment. No, God, in keeping his promise, is saving Israel out of oppressive rule to live under his rule and blessing instead. This is the blessings of the kingdom. God said back in Exodus 3 that um, even in their slavery, one day they would reach a mountain they would look back and they would remember how God saved them from Egypt. And so now here, as Israel gather at the foot of Mount Sinai, it would be undeniable that God's promise is unbreakable. Um, notice the movements in our passage in verse 4. God, in keeping His promise, has brought them out of slavery He's lifted them up on eagles' wings and He's drawn them near to Himself. This is the same way God covenants with us, isn't it? He brings us out of slavery to sin, He lifts us up in salvation and He draws us near. So that now we have a new King Jesus whose yoke is easy and burden is light. Um, often people see Christianity as just another religion where the foundation of our religion is just be a good person, live a good life, God will accept you. Well, that couldn't be more wrong because the foundation of our relationship with God here is salvation. 
Here God is saying there is nothing that you can do to earn my acceptance or win my love. God reminds them, you did not fight your way out of captivity, did you? No, he carried you out on eagle's wings. Um, Even in um, the Ten Commandments in, in chapter 20, remember how they begin. Even as God begins by outlining the covenant, he outlines the foundation by saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. God's covenant and his law is based on salvation. Do you see, it means that we obey not to be saved, we obey because we've been saved. Um, But this is so easily a truth we can forget. Uh, Martin Luther says that religion is the default mode of the human heart. So even where God has saved us first, that's undeniable. Our hearts can be so drawn to earn salvation for ourselves. Um, When God saved me about um, 16 years ago now, uh, my life completely changed. Um, Everything became a delight to me. Um, So I wanted to serve in any way I could. So um, I put my hand up to be a Bible reader. Uh, I was a welcomer. Um, I led Sunday school. Um, I even became a music leader, even though I couldn't sing. That didn't last very long. Um, I loved reading God's Word. I loved sharing my faith. Everything was a privilege and a delight to me. Um, But um, after a while, um, these things that I once delighted in actually started to feel like a burden. Um, Instead of wanting to do these things, getting to do these things, it started to feel like I had to do them. Um, The delight was gone and only duty remained. And and so what changed for me? Well, I came to realize that over time, I had forgotten the foundation of my faith. Um, I I want you to think about your life and think, I wonder whether it feels sometimes like your Christianity has become only duty and not delight. Maybe your faith feels like a burden to you. I've got to read the Bible, I've got to pray, I've got to come to church every Sunday. All these things I have to do to be a Christian. No, I wonder if Christianity is so misunderstood by our world because when they look at us, they see a religion of works instead of grace. When they look at us, maybe they see a faith that's characterized by duty, which has lost its delight. And so we must never forget here the foundation of our covenant with God. So what about the obligations? Let's now consider our part in the covenant. How do we relate to God? Now, once we have been saved, now we have been brought into relationship with Him. In verse 5, God says to Moses, Therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the people. God calls his people to keep his covenant by obeying his voice. Um, When you marry someone and enter into covenant with them, you willingly take on the obligations. Um, So on your wedding day, you don't stand there saying, when you're making vows, you don't stand there saying, you mean I have to be with this person for the rest of my life? You mean I have to to keep coming home to the same person every day for better or worse, rich or poor? That's not what I signed up for. No, 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 you don't say that, do you? You love to obey them. You love to serve the other person because in the covenant, their delight has become your delight, right? Their joy now has become your joy. It's the same with God. In the law, God shows us what He delights in. And here He calls His people to a moral vision of life that's going to be so countercultural, so life-giving, that simply by them keeping it, Israel would bless the nations. Um, In these Ten Commandments, you'll notice the first four are about loving the God who saved them. The remaining six are about loving the people He treasures. 
Um, you can tell what a country is like through its laws. Uh, we're really blessed to live in Australia that has a pretty fair legal system um, when compared to many other countries in the world. And you can see how a settled legal system allows our country to function and flourish. Um, but sadly, where countries don't have a strong framework of laws or resources to enforce them, you'll, you'll see the country often descends into chaos and violence. Um, the country quickly becomes governed by martial law, where the people with the biggest guns call all the shots. And so, in the same way you can tell what a country is like from its laws, you can tell what God is like through His laws. Um, the Ten Commandments are kind of like your headline statements for the whole of the law. And what follows in Exodus and Leviticus are laws that govern how Israel would apply these Ten Commandments to their nation and how they would approach God in the temple. Uh, so now, now if you look at these Ten Commandments here, you'll notice that a lot of them are telling us what not to do, Right? So don't murder, don't steal, don't lie. Now you might look at this and you might think, man, man, these laws are a bit basic. But no, actually they are absolutely genius. They are radical for its day. Um, a helpful way I've heard to um, the law explained is like a circle. Um, the Ten Commandments, they provide the boundaries which we can't cross. But remember, God calls Israel to be holy as He is holy. So the goal of the law isn't to enable us to live as close to the boundaries as we can. No, the goal of the law is that we would run in the opposite direction, away from these boundaries, towards the center. Um, so for example, this command not to murder sets the boundaries for our conduct. But as we head towards the center, we bypass not cursing anyone, not even thinking a violent thought about anyone, until we reach the center, which is to positively promote the life and flourishing in all people. Or think about the command to steal. The command to steal sets the boundary. And then on the way through, we don't even get jealous. We don't envy anyone until we reach the center, which is to cultivate contentment, to seek justice for those around us. It's the same with lying, which is about promoting truth. It's about promoting the truth in all situations. And so with adultery, you run away from not sleeping with anyone, then you bypass not even lusting after someone, until you reach the center, which is about pursuing faithfulness, about pursuing purity in all our relationships. And I want you to notice that as your life drives towards this center, what you find there is the character of God, right? D did you see how the law is actually about restoring the image of God in us? Um, I'm not making this up. This is how Jesus interprets the Ten Commandments, isn't it? He says where the Pharisees want to define their religion by the boundaries, by not crossing the boundaries... No, Jesus drives us to head towards the center. He says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And so do you see, in this way, you can't just look at these Ten Commandments and think, just because I haven't murdered anyone, then we're doing well. No, these laws will demand your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Your obligations to the covenant of God is going to change everything. Um, we live in an age of half commitments, um, where instead of committing fully to something, we make half-hearted choices. Um, when you're invited to an event on Facebook, there's an option to click interested or maybe when you RSVP. I'm sure you guys have used that button before. Basically, what it means is um, I'm interested in attending your event. I might attend your event. But I'm not going to fully commit until I check out my options, until I see if I have anything better to do that day. Maybe I'll check if my friends are going as well, then maybe I'll turn up. Now, do you see, we live in an age of half commitments and broken promises where we prefer to keep our options open all the time 
at the hope of a better deal. And, and, and we do the same with God. We may be willing to commit to Him, but maybe only to a certain point. Maybe you're willing to change until you know, it becomes a sacrifice of time and energy and resources, and perhaps it's just a bit too much. No, 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 putting sin to death is not meant to be easy, right? In your obedience, you are putting to death parts of yourself that is going to be a painful process. It is not easy. Um, the author Dallas Willard, he talks about vampire Christianity, um, in which we say to Jesus, I'd like a little of your blood, please, but I don't care to be your student or have your character. Um, in fact, won't you just excuse me? I just want to get on with my life. I'll, I'll see you in heaven. You know, perhaps all we want is just a little bit of Jesus' blood for salvation. But we don't really want to change. We have no desire to fully obey. Just leave me alone. I'll see you in heaven. No, when we commit half-heartedly to the commands of God, do you see how it is so inconsistent with a God who saved you? A God who bled for you and died for you so that you would live. A Savior that didn't love you half-heartedly, but John says loved you to the very end. It's not meant to be easy. And so even under this new covenant that we live in, our obligations are the same, isn't it? To walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, to give your whole life to Him just as He gave His whole life to us. Um, the people in verse 8, they say, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. And so perhaps today is a good time to reevaluate your life. I want you to ask, is there anything that you've put off in following Jesus? Just because it's hard. Whether it's putting a sin to death, um, whether it's taking a risk and stepping out of your comfort zone for the sake of Christ. But remember, in all this, our obedience to the law isn't about earning salvation. Because in the law, remember, God gives Israel a sacrificial system. God builds into His law a means of atoning for their sin and putting things right. So even in this, the law is still filled with grace because God is providing us even a way to deal with our failures and constantly apply the gospel to our lives. Um, and we're back in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, they're away from His presence. What do the laws of sacrifice and tabernacle do? They enable God's people to enter His presence again. Do You see, the Christian life, even the law, is filled with grace from first to last. These are our obligations under the covenant, which, when you think about it, really is God's gift to us for our good. And so finally, God's covenant isn't just filled with obligations, but great privileges. Um, so far in giving the law, God has told His people who He is, and now He will tell them who they are. Uh, verse 5, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice, keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. The whole earth is mine. You shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God here, He says, everything belongs to me. The whole earth is mine. But he's chosen Israel, this to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Um, priests were God's representatives to his people to mediate his presence amongst them. So just like there were specific priests chosen to meet with God, did you see here the whole nation is chosen as priests to meet with him and represent him to the world? And so it means that our deepest privilege, actually, as Christians, is the access that we have to God. The access that we have to God. Um, I love golf. I don't know if you knew that about me, but my hero used to be Tiger Woods. It kind of still is Tiger Woods, actually. But, and when he came to play golf um, in Melbourne, this is in 2010. I don't know if this is in 2010, but I was there in 2010. 
Um, I was trying to get as close to him as possible. Um, I was lucky enough to get his autograph um, in Melbourne. And man, I was so privileged to have that kind of access to him. I was so privileged to see him up close. My hero, it was amazing. But do you know what? (laughs) I'm guessing Tiger Woods doesn't know who Devon is. That's fair to say. I think it's fair to say as well, that moment when he signed my cap means more to me than it does for him. I don't think he remembers that. No, he, he knows nothing about me. And so for the God of the universe here to know our name, to be called his treasured possession, is, shows the incredible depth of the privilege we have. Um, there will be many times in your life when you feel like you are constantly breaking your promises to God. You will feel that your obedience to Jesus will feel overwhelming. It will feel hard. Uh, Maybe every day just trying to follow Jesus, you feel the weight of your own weaknesses, your own shortcomings. And so maybe right now, you, you don't like who you are. But the privilege of the covenant here is that in spite of how you feel, God tells you who you really are. Um, The word treasure refers to the private wealth of a great king. Remember, the king owned everything, right? And so his treasure was what was most precious to him. And that's who we are to God. Um, The late Tim Keller, he says, The central basis of Christian assurance is not how much our hearts are set on God, but how unshakably his heart is set on us. That's what we mean to God. Um, This identity as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation carries great value, uh, but also great purpose. Um, Because just as priests would bring people to God so they could be in in His presence and see what He is like, you see, God chose Israel to bring the nations to Himself and show the world who He is. Um, 1 Peter 2, it applies this language. Notice it applies this language of royal priesthood, holy nation, who? To us, right? To the church. Because in Christ, we have God's Spirit living in us. And so now, empowered by the Spirit, our goal is to proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Because of this access that we have to God, we're called to preach the gospel and make Jesus known. That's why we go. That's why people like Mike get trained up to go for missions. The author, uh, Phil Riken, he says Israel weren't just chosen from the nations, but for the nations. And the same is true for us, actually. If you're a Christian, you have been placed in your world, you've been given these relationships, to be the presence of God and bring the gospel to them. You've been placed in your job so that your bosses and colleagues would come to know what God is like and see who He is. As you place their interests over your own, as you speak well of your colleagues, you don't speak down to them, as you show them why following Jesus is more valuable than pursuing your career, You'll be placed in your friendship group so you would care for them so well, you would carry their burdens so that they would experience the love of Christ. They would experience the love of Christ through your words and your lives. And even though it might be so hard, you've been placed in your families to show them how being in God's family transforms how you honour your parents, transforms how you love your siblings and how you disciple your children. And maybe for some of you, like Mike, God will place a desire in your heart to one day go to a different country as a gospel worker or a missionary and bring the good news of Jesus to those who have never heard His name. Um, One day, this kingdom of priests will be a multicultural and multi-ethnic reality. And these people will all together sing to Jesus, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll, 
For you were slain by your blood, you ransomed people from every tribe, tongue, language, people, nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to God. Now, the reason why here at Cross Culture we're so passionate about bringing the gospel to all nations is because we realize we are so profoundly privileged. And so no sacrifice could be too great for the one who saved us, for the one who calls us to radical obedience, for the one who gives us a new identity for the sake of the nations. Um, So as we uh, journey through the Old Testament, as we witness the kingdom of God revealed, uh, this is where we are now. Um, Israel are meeting with God at the foot of Sinai. They are God's covenant people with whom God has re-established His rule and blessing through the law. Um, But remember, they're they're still in the wilderness. They're saved out of Egypt, and now they're on the journey to the promised land in Canaan. And so things are starting to take shape. And next week, we'll reach the high point of God's kingdom in the Old Testament. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this deep privilege you have bestowed on us as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Lord, we thank you that we are your saved people, bought by the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb Jesus Christ crucified. And Father, we pray that out of this deep sense of gratitude, our obedience will be whole, it won't be half-hearted, and Lord, um, our vision will for your mission would go right to the ends of the earth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.